Good, good, good. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's been the uh, third week already, or fourth week, as we are doing this series on Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. And we are discussing about spiritual blessing. Amen. So, uh, is, can anyone still follow the series? Huh? Oh, well, nakukuha na abutan niyo pa may series na some of you might be able to uh, uh, we're not here for the past few weeks and, and then we were, you know, this is very important, you know, that to establish, to know what what do Christians have in, the, in, in Christ, you know, that spiritual blessing, that promises, that God promises to us. And then today, what we are going to, to discuss is something more important because most of us Christians is having this problem like losing this this thing that they have in him you know there is this one thing Christian have because Christian is full of grace amen, amen. full of grace full of mercy and then the other thing full of love as well and then the other thing that is a Christian uh, is filled is, is he is filled with hope amen? amen he is filled with hope in tagalog punong puno ng pag-asa yeah but in reality christians doesn't experience that kind of uh spiritually filled of hope hindi po lahat not everyone of us has this hope. Now we are going to the, to read Ephesians 1 verse 11 to 12. So we are now on the verse 11 and 12 and this is what the Lord is saying. Also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now from verse 12 to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us all pray. Father, we want to be people full of unshakable hope so that we are fearless, so that we return good for evil so that people will see and wonder what are you hoping in so that we can make this defense lord help us in jesus name amen amen now when you talk about hope what is the first thing that you, that comes to your mind for sure a lot of you might think hope is something that is hard you know in a christian life why i will tell you why because oftentimes, when problems arises, when situation arises, that hope is started to fail. I remember a few weeks ago when I was with Brother Barry. That was like three weeks ago. And I know he knows the word for a time being. And that situation arises with Sister Ella. And the first thing that I heard from him is, What's wrong? You need to come here. What's wrong? Sister Ella, I can sense something is wrong. That's not, that's not a big deal. That's not a problem. When someone gets a little worried sometimes, but you see, in a Christian life, the first thing na nauwawala sa relasyon natin sa Diyos is yung hope. Yan po ang bagay na nauwawala. Something that is starting to play right away in our Christian life. When you don't have a job right now, and then you've been off for like one year, some of our friends here who doesn't have work right now, I would hear calls saying, Pastor, 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 Pastor,
people are Christians. Hello? And these people are Christians. And they're saying, Pastor, wala ko. Wala ko. I think I should do it my way. I think I should do it, do this and that. Because I believe there is no hope for you. Wala nang pag -asa. And it's what Christ wants us to have. Christ wants us to hope in Him. That's why in verse 11 it says, To the end that He who were the first to hope in Christ. A problem po sa mag-asawa, sometimes we have problem in our marriage. There is this one guy again who approached me and said, Pastor, wala na pong mag -asa. Now, if you're a Christian, let me ask you, what is your defense? <laughs> How would you say, there is hope in Christ? Yeah, right. <laughs> How would you say, a person who is sick of cancer, there is hope? I know how sure you are that there is hope. And this is what we are going to find out today. We need to find the reason for that hope. We cannot just say, we have hope in Christ. There is hope in Christ. Really? Because when situation arises, you won't even say that. You won't even think about it. You will often do what you think is right. Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe, I know, I should do this. And then, and that's what, where Satan comes. That's where Satan would say, Oh, an opportunity for me. First Peter, if I'm going to step a little bit. In First Peter, now, before I go to First Peter, this is what I want us <coughs> to bring when you go home. That's hope. That hope, I put that in an acronym, it means holding on to God's promise each day. It's like holding on, on to. If you, have, if you are full of hope, you need to hold on to His promises every day of your life. You need that. That's what you need. You need that promise in its day. Now, one of the most wonderful parts of the Bible is the letter that Apostle Paul wrote in the church of Ephesus. Amen? It's called the letter to the Ephesus. This wonderful letter expresses some tremendous life transforming truths. And for us, this afternoon, I think God is going to really speak about something that is exceedingly wonderful as we anticipate the things God has prepared for us. Now, that brings me to share with you the thoughts in Ephesians 1 because they are really, if you're going to read it, they are really about the promise of God in Jesus Christ to everyone who believes. Amen? There are some things that can make life meaningful. There are some fantastic things that God has planned for those that are in Christ. Some promises that God will keep. So this Ephesians is not just a spiritual blessing. It is all about the promise of God in Christ to all believers. Now, when you use the word promise, you know, maybe some people would be suspicious about it. Because, let's face it, we all know people who make promises and didn't give. Ilang po sa inyo mahin mga ako? How many of you wants to make promises? I promise every year. <laughs> huh? New Year's Day. I promise I will not do this anymore. Because, what birthday mo? I promise, starting now, I will not do this. I'll stop doing this. <laughs> we always make promises that we didn't keep. 
And finally, we all made those promises ourselves and didn't keep that. I made promises, several promises to my wife. When we were here in Canada, I always, she, always, uh, she always tells me about going to these places in Canada. There are beautiful places here. And, and then she will, she will tell me, oh, promise, huh? we will go there. And praise God, after five years, six years here in Canada, we're still here in Edmonton. <laughs> so, because I will always say, yes, yes, oh yeah, yeah, oh come on, yeah, yeah, let's go there to Bath, yes. Believe me, I've never been there. <laughs> Jasper, I've never been there. <laughs> and now, those were the promises I made to my wife that I didn't keep. Some of us are like that. Maybe all of us are like that. <laughs> we make promises that we didn't keep. But there is one who makes promises and never breaks. That's Jesus Christ. And this divine promises he makes here in Ephesians 1 from 3 to 14 is above all things. Wonderful, incredible, and exciting. And I want to share with you this afternoon what Paul has to say about this. We need to understand what are those promises. Because these promises will help us to have that hope. To establish that hope in our lives. Now, like I've said, if we're going to 1 Peter 3, 15. This is what Peter said. This is what the Lord said in 1 Peter 3, 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. Look at the word. To make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So, now this is the situation right now. Not all of us can make that defense. Maybe we can simply, simply say, when we talk about hope, hope in Christ. And that's about it. But we need to to make a defense, we need to prepare to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope. Because people in, outside of this Christian world will ask you, what is the hope that you have right now? I have my hope in Christ. So, what is that? And Peter was saying, make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Hallelujah. Now, every Christian can do that because what it means to be a Christian is now is to know what's the basis, the reason of our hopes. Yes. Now, right here in this context, we have Christ. We can see right away Christ, the Messiah. We have the Lord. Christ, the Lord. The Lord means the ruler. The reason is Christ as holy means perfect. Once we lay that foundation, we can simply say Christ is our hope. Amen? Amen? Christ is Lord of all. That's our hope. Christ is perfect and precious. My greatest treasure, my friends. That's my hope. But, but, if we are trying, if we are going to grow it up, and look at the rest of the passage in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, we can see what Christ has done to give us hope. Hallelujah. Now let's read. Let's read verse Ephesians 3. Let's go back from verse Ephesians 3, 11 and see. Because now in this passage, I want us to examine what God's master planning history, which is the basic key to the whole thing that leads us to that hope. So if you want to find out where the hope, our hope is coming from, that promise that we have in Christ, we need, we need, we need to know, we need to examine what's God's 
master plan in history. Yes. And that's a, let us recall from Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Remember, this few weeks ago, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He, remember this preaching, He predestined us to adoption as Son through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Now, in Him, remember that last preaching, we talked about redemption. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Then from last week, you remember, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. And then, now, also we have obtained inheritance having predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be the praise of our glory. Now, the first key, if you're going to read from verse 3, the first key that He used, or the plan that He used, was based on what? Election. Amen? Chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. That's what the verse is saying. Some people do not appreciate the feeling of being chosen. Christians oftentimes doesn't value when God chosen chose you. Remember, where were you when you were not yet with the Lord? I remember eight years ago. Before I stand here in this pulpit, eight years ago, I know where I am. I know what I've been through in my life. I, I made so many money, like Brother Fire was saying. I made so many money too. I made millions. But it didn't give me that satisfaction in my life. And it creates so many troubles, so many problems in my life. And then, that's why I appreciate when God called me, He chose me to be His partner of His kingdom. Imagine, out of so many billions, you were chosen. In verse 4 said, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. What a privilege, friends. That's what gives us our value as people. That's what gives us our sense of worth. Alam niyo ba yun? Mahalaga kayo sa Diyos. Do you realize that that is you? You who love Jesus Christ are in this church, have received Him as your Savior, you were master plan by God into the church before the world began. He have already chosen. Now, the second thing that I want to discuss is this. Remember, you need to really summarize this so you can see where your hope is coming from. You need to find that reason. First, because you were chosen. You were just chosen before the foundation of the world. You have to realize that. You have to realize that. Second thing that I want you to understand, the second word that he uses, if you recall, the redemption. First, that is election. 
that the first part of it, God's choosing. Then, redemption. In verse 7, we've been redeemed. Now, that simply says that those who elected, He redeemed. Amen? The Greek word used for redeem is retrosis, and has a literal meaning of a ransoming. But I explained about it last time. It means deliverance or a rescue. And that is exactly what Jesus has done by giving his own life over 2,000 years ago. He paid the price at the Calvary. When we are redeemed, we become different people. That's what it is. Christians, once you are redeemed, you have a new identity in Christ. No longer is the Christian a captive to sin and death. Instead, he becomes citizen of God's kingdom. Christians now live in anticipation of our eternal home with our Heavenly Father. Now, let me ask you, when we talk about potential, which was being discussed a few weeks ago. How do you act as a someone who is being with them, being with him? If Jesus has already paid the price, now let me ask you, how do you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ? How do you treat other people outside of the world? You are no longer captive to sin and death. Friends, you are free to do what is right. You are free to do what is good because of His grace, because of the redemption, because He redeemed you already. No one will say, So, my dear, my dear, I don't think it's, you know, it's impossible. Friends, you are already living in anticipation of our eternal home. I preached about last few weeks ago about our status here that we are aliens of this world. We no longer treat this place as our oh, this is our, you know, ah, see how it could be by. You know, that, that is good. But you don't pull your whole life this world, right? Because Jesus said, God said, you are not of this world anymore. So when you're experiencing something in your life, like for example, you are having situation in your life that you said, Hi, I'm here up, it's hard. But remember this. This is happening here in this world, a temporary. And because you have redeemed already, you are anticipating a higher blessing, eternal blessing. I don't know, some Christians still may stuck in Sebenong India. They are still stuck, their mind and ideas are still stuck in this world. Trying to say, oh, I have to make a living, I have to do this. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, yes. But it seems like you have forgotten who you are. And you're, you're standing in Christ. You have forgotten your, who you are as a Christian. And that's what it means when you're being redeemed by God. Now, the third word that he uses in verse 11 and 12 is inheritance. As you see, and that's what we were going to stretch out a little bit from verse 11 and 12. The reason he chose us, he wants to redeem us. And then the reason he redeemed us was to give us what? What? Are you still with me? <laughs> Where did it go? The reason He chose us is to redeem us. Now, He redeemed us 
was to give us what? Inheritance. Hallelujah. You are still with me. Thank you, Lord. To give us great and precious promises. That's what we're talking about right now. We are trying to anticipate that precious promises. That's fulfilling. You see, he realized that God had some things for him that far surpasses some of the iniquities of life. But that's the way God is. See? And that's because God loves us and has masterplanned us into an incredible promise that He fulfilled. Now, look at verse 11. What did it say there? In whom, sorry, yeah, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Okay? Amen? Now, watch this. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Let's, let's, let's keep it close on this verse. Now wait, this is the word of God to us. He's saying, we have obtained, we, we have obtained an inheritance. Now, what tense is that? What tense that he did he use? Huh? What, what tense? Verb. He used past tense, amen? Past tense. That means it already happened, amen? Amen? Now, let me talk about this phrase for just a second. Verse 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now, form of the Greek words here is in a passive form. The verb is passive. Meaning, in this case, it can be translated in two ways. Now, we have to translate this into two parts. Huh? Yes. I will explain to you. The passive verb can translate that into two ways. That's what it means when you say passive verb. Now, first, that we, the first thing that we can look at in this verse is Jesus Christ inherited us. Now, if you're going to look at the verse 11, it says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Now, if we take that meaning for the phrase 10, it means that we are Christ inheritance we are Christ's inheritance in other words Christ inherited us hallelujah you're saying that's no bargain well it's true though Christ inherited us listen to Jesus own words in John 16 37 it says it in John 6 37 he was praying, all the, that the Father gives me, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. You see, we are the gift from the Father to the Son. Hallelujah. You see, when I received Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, God was saying here, and when you receive Jesus Christ, God was telling us, I present to you, Sister Eds. He was being presented to Jesus. That's the sense in which we are His inheritance. And you see, God has granted to the Son the inheritance of the church. He has given Him the church as a reward for his faithfulness because of what Jesus has done because he has been faithful to the Father he inherited us he died on the cross and rose again and that's the Bible says in Philippians 2 that God exalted him and gave him the name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow you know what? God not only exalted Jesus because of his wonderful work on the cross and coming out of the grave. God not only exalted him, but God gave him the spoils of victory at the cross. And you and I are his soils. He won us at Calvary and we, we, all of us, are his inheritance. We are all his heritage you say i don't understand why probably you would say this i don't understand why the father would want to give me to the son 
Well, that's the way God's grace and love works. Now, if you're struggling around with a sense of lack of self-worth or self-respect, sometimes you will feel not getting along with Christians. Parang isa sa sabi mo, because you feel that, you know, sabi ng Christ is young, you know, ito lang ako, you know, I want to be there because I don't think I belong to them. Now, if you say that, just realize that you are important enough to God for God to take you, to win you, and to give you back to Jesus as an inheritance. Friends, you are a gift from the Father to the Son. You are a gift, a love gift. Hallelujah. Remember that. If you feel down, if you feel like you don't belong, I've made so many mistakes, brothers, I've made so many, you would say that. I don't think I belong in Rome. When Christ chose you, He said, I inherited you. You are my victory. You see that? Now, if you're living in that kind of idea, what kind of hope you have right now? That you are Christ's possession. If you are, if you, if Christ inherited you, it means He owns you. Now, what problems you think that Christ doesn't want? Does not? Is not? He's not concerned. If He owns you, if you have problems in your life right now. And if Christ is saying, I but you are mine. Now what problems do you have that you think Christ is not concerned of? Yeah, I, I own you. I own you. I own you, I think. But I mean that. In Acts 20, 28, it says here, be on guard that be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The church which Christ purchased with what? He purchased with what? His own blood. He bought us. We're his inheritance, my friends. We are His inheritance. We belong to Him. We are His personal possession. Tandaan niyo yan. Always remember that. Now look at the person beside you. It doesn't matter how he looks like. Kung maganda man o pangit o ano. Christ possessed that. So, huwag kayong magtaka. Kung nakasimangat, okay lang. Pangitingin mo. Hallelujah. We are Christ's possession. Pag-aari tayo ng Diyos. Sarap po pang marinig yun? Ha? Isn't it beautiful to hear that we are Christ's possession? <laughs> now, if you are trying to say something that nice to a person, remember, that is his possession. <laughs> I'm telling you that. I'm telling you now, if you're doing something with your brother, sister, remember that you, that that brother or sister of yours is Christ's possession. Amen. Hallelujah. The last thing, the second thing that I would like to discuss. Yes, so that's the one thing this phrase could mean. But it could mean something else. So, in whom we have obtained his inheritance. So, that could mean something else too because of the form of the verb. It could also mean the way it's translated in the authorized, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. It could also mean that we inherit Christ. Hallelujah. In whom we have obtained an inheritance. It can also mean that we have received Christ as 
an inheritance, friends. We have received Christ. So in one sense, his, uh, in one sense, we are, we are his inheritance, and in another sense, he is ours. Hallelujah. Friends, we got a better deal here. We inherit Christ. When you become a Christian, he become he becomes yours. Hallelujah. When he when we became a Christian, we inherited him. He became mine. Christ becomes ours. And that's what Apostle Paul says in Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. He says, Now watch, for all things are yours. All things are yours. He says, Now watch, for all things are yours, whether Paul, Apollos, or Stephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All are yours. Hallelujah. In other words, he says, you inherit everything. It's all yours. You have obtained an inheritance in Christ. And then in the very next verse, he said this, and you are Christ. You inherit everything, and he inherits you. Is that a beautiful union with the Lord? Amen. Amen. You see, now listen, when you become a Christian, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. One spirit, you become one with Jesus, and you know what happens? He becomes yours, and you become His. So that you lose your identity. A Christian has no identity apart from Christ. You see, if Christ, you inherit Christ, one thing that you will lose is your identity. You are not on your own anymore. Okay, I, sometimes I felt so down. I feel so bad. I feel so sad. I felt, you know, I would feel so sad. Hearing until now, most of us are having problems in giving. I would always wonder, Lord, what's wrong with these people? Have they completely forgotten that Christ, that they inherited Christ already? You know what it means when you inherited Christ? You know what it means when Christ is in you, friends? I will show you what it means when you inherited Christ. I will show you what you have right now. Philippians 4, 19 And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's the kind of Christ that you have right now. I'll give you one more. Look at the birds in the air that they do not sow or reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Imagine what you have. In Psalms 81, I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Amen. What else? The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Amen. Hallelujah. Second Peter 1 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through and through knowledge of him who called us by his grace and glory and excellence. Hallelujah. See, when you inherit Christ, you are missing something. You know that you have everything when you have Christ. And now you're telling me I have problems, Pastor. 